Hey, what's up, Shining Otaku? Welcome to a brand new season of Shining Spotlight, where we interview and highlight guests in the industry, manga, you know, some comics, and a little bit of animation from time to time in order to inspire you guys. I am one of your hosts, Irvin, and today I'm actually welcoming on another host that we're going to have today, a co-host, Che Baker. How y'all doing today? It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So today we actually are going to have... Um, a uh, really special guest that you know, um, you know that we both actually know personally. Uh, today we have a creator who has been in the game much longer than ourselves. His experience spanning over thirty years with his com his uh, brand of Dreadlocks Comics. He has even gone on to create his own convention uh, known as the Motor City Black Age of Comics since twenty ten, I believe. And now, you know, it's also known as the Motor City Black Age of Comics and Manga. Today, we welcome the prolific pioneer, Andre Batts, to the show. Thank you so much for coming on today, Andre. Let's clap it up for Andre. So, I've, and something happened with the camera. Let me see here. Oh, here he goes. All right. There we go. Yeah, we're, so, we're here. <laughs> all right. So, looking good. Looking good. <laughs> have to say, Andre, you know, it's really, you know, an honor for you to come on today. You know, um, you know, you've been doing the convention for, you know, quite a while. You know, you've been putting out comics for over 30 years, mm. you know, so there's so much. Uh, I'm sure there's so many jewels that you can give us today, you know, to a lot of the audience. A lot of the people that we have on this that, you know, watch this show, obviously, are a lot of manga creators. You know, sometimes you have okay. a little bit of people who are interested in other parts of the industry. Uh, but, you know, can you just like tell everybody a little bit about you know what inspired you to even jump in this game you know we all know that comics can be very difficult to be able to kind of move in sometimes so I'm, mm -hmm. we're just curious about that well basically you know I, you know coming up you know reading comics after school you know all that good stuff reading uh the likes of spider-man dr strange marvel dc e-man if, if any of you ever heard of e-man but uh needless to say that was uh, e a comic yeah, e e no, E man, like E, e. Yeah, I yeah, e dash e man. man. <laughs> a lot of people never heard of it, but he was like a mixture of uh, uh, Mr. Fantastic and uh, yeah, these superpowers. It was a uh, independent comic that they used mm -hmm. to sell at a, uh, at a, at a uh, this store called Federals back then. Oh, I'm man. sure you never even heard of Federals before. <laughs> but yeah, needless say, my time, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> but needless say, I used to read those. And uh, when I went off into the military, I was still, you know, into my comics, reading my comics. So I started creating uh, my own comics because why? I didn't see enough representation as far as black superheroes or black characters in the comic uh, industry. It was just a few, uh, mainly, you know, like Black Panther right there. Black Panther, you know, you had Luke Cage, Black Goliath, uh, Black Lightning, a few, just a few characters that I would read here and there, uh, but it was no representation, and I felt that it was a need to uh, get myself out there. There were others out there as well, a few, that I just basically followed their lead. Okay, okay. So, you know, I think of, um, when I think of, like, a, like I guess, of course, you mentioned, like, for example, like, you think about Black Panther. A lot of people got to realize, like, Black Panther wasn't even made by, like, you know, Black creators. You know, right. so when did you um, I guess, when did you start to see like, um, you know, more of this movement where you started having more black creators like yourself come about, like, you know, were you the, the genesis of it? Like, or, you know, who was the genesis of, of this, that you kind of started seeing the beginnings of this, you know, back. In well, the I would say that, um, I was part of the genesis. The genesis started with, um, uh, Dawu Ayinbuele, uh, Alfonso Washington, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, Dawu, he did, um, Big City Entertainment, uh, Brother Man Comics. Uh, that was his 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 brand. Uh, you had uh, Original Man, Omega Man from Alfonso Washington. You had Tribe of, uh, which was part of Image, which was still part of the mainstream logo. Uh, they did um, their story. Tribe uh, was um, Larry Strowman and Todd Johnson, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a few others that did some things or whatever. And that's when I got into doing my comments because I actually met uh, Larry Stroman and Todd Johnson at, uh, at Todd's uh, comic book store he had on Nine Mile in Ferndale. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I talked with uh, Larry Strowman for the most part. He gave me some nice pointers or whatever as far as the art was concerned. So I started looking more into that. And when I met Dawood, I met him back in 95, I think, in D.C. And, uh, you know, it was just the brother. He was passing out these these dope ass uh Oh, excuse the language there. <laughs> he, he so you're all good. These, you're all good, adult. We good. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, good. He was passing out these dope uh, prints that he did on postcard of those different stars that he did, and the artwork was just so, just, just amazing. And uh, when I when I got a, a piece from him, I was like, man, this looks familiar, you know, because I got a couple of these books that I bought, you know, at a place, you know, at a, a store of shrine of the Black Madonna, and uh. And come to find out, he was the creator of the books that I bought at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Mm. And I was like, wow. And then I started talking to him a little bit. Because I met him at the uh, Million Man March. That's when I met him. Okay. And uh, when we were talking, he was telling me, you know, a few of the things that he, he was doing and what he's done. And I basically just followed suit after that. And one, once I met him, at that point, I was motivated. I was already motivated by what I wasn't seeing in the industry. But... um that just pushed me where I needed to be and where I needed to go. Okay. Okay. And you dropped a lot of jewels on us through that whole tidbit, right? It's so much information in this first five minutes that people may have not have missed out on. So um, I would encourage you all when you watch the interview to really pay attention because there's a lot of jewels being dropped. Uh, I wish we had the little effect where the jeweler just kind of comes Oh, out. no, we got to do that. We got to do that. We're going to drop a little effect for you guys so that way you can know when we're dropping the jewels so you can go back and uh, think about that and look into it. So going back into that, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate you as a creative because you're one of the people who inspired me at a very young age back Mm, probably 25 years ago. And you oh, had you were like school. six. You said what? I said <laughs> you, you were around six years yeah, old. Yeah, I was super little. I was very yeah, little. little. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And you was like, you can do this too. Right. And how important right. it was to see a black creator use their voice um, mm -hmm. in order to help us. But so I want to ask you, uh, what are some of the current projects that you are working on right now? Well, my current projects I have a, a couple of them in the fire right now. We have uh, Techno Wars, which is basically uh, based off the icon of um, the, what I use for the Motor City Black Age of con comics. Uh, and what it is it, basically, uh, let me see in a nutshell. Uh, you know, it's certain words I couldn't use, like cyber, Cybertrons and all that, because, you know, of course, Transformers, they bit off of, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Cybertron and the record's clear. Oh, yeah. cosmic cars and all that good stuff mm -hmm. but a lot of that was out long before the transformers movie even came out or the, the animated movie mm. but it's kind of like uh based off of based off of that to some degree uh we have um jihad ad i'm working on animation movie well not animated movie but an animated video games that i'm currently working on now is actually finished so i just gotta uh get ready to upload and, and get that ready for the public to see uh also let me see what else am i working on so much we got the gaming we got the techno techno wars we got several things that i'm working on it's just so much that i'm working dreadlocks. on all at once and of course you know dreadlocks is yeah you've got to work on dreadlocks you know you can't you, you can't do urban style comics without having dreadlocks done on a consistent basis because hmm. when i do my shows most of the people that they come in and looking for they're looking for dreadlocks and everything that I, everything else that I offer them is just a gift for the most part. And they really love the fact that they can see all the other stuff that I've uh, transpired into. Hmm. But uh, the video game, I'm excited about that. You know, it looks real good. Um, hoping to show a little bit of a, a trailer at the Motor City Black Age of Comics and Manga that's coming up soon, this hmm. Saturday and Sunday, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Once that drops, a lot of people check that out, and then I'll be having it available for people to play it when I go to Atlanta next month. Okay. Well, one, I look forward to the video game. I was on the Urban Style website, and I saw that. I said, oh, I didn't know this was happening, so you're doing oh, okay. big things right here, Andre. Okay. I'm looking right. forward to it. Um, okay, but I wanted good, to touch good. bases a little bit on uh, Black Age. I was wondering, okay. like, how did you get your start in the Motor City Black Age, and um, you know, what are some of the pros and cons really challenges and some of the, the the good things that have happened coming from black age well it's been a lot of challenges but i'll, I'll go i'll start with um 
the original question. Basically, um, the, the Black Age was started by a brother named Turtel Only. We call him uh, the godfather of the Black Age. He's from Chicago. He started back in uh, 93. I've heard of it back then, and I wanted to check it out, but I knew nothing about it as far as the location and where they were having it. And was it a set venue where they had it all the time? So I didn't know. But just it just so happened that a few years after that, I think it was in the 2000, uh, I think 2002, I went to, uh, to well, the uh, Wizard World in Philadelphia. Oh. And uh, when I was in Wizard World, Philadelphia, I met a brother named Stacy Robinson. Uh, he, he was familiar with uh, Dreadlocks, and he mentioned to me that, you know, I need to go check out this event called the uh, East Coast Black Age Comics. And he told me what it was all about. And I was like, wow, that's right up my alley, you know, because my other brothers that was with me, you know, I told them, you know, you, basically they could hold the fort down there. And I wanted to go check out what this uh, Ekbok was all about, East Coast Black Edge Comics. So when I went down there, it was in, in, at Temple University. And by me being familiar with uh, Philadelphia, because I used to stay there when I was in the Navy, I went down to Temple University and I walked in there and I was amazed at what I was seeing. Uh, they let me set up a quick table and uh, I ended up being on one of the panels there and it was like a, a beautiful thing. So I met the brother that started that. His name was Yumi Odom, y Yumi Odom. And when I met him, you know, he was a good brother. He's still a good brother. When I met him, he told me a couple of things or whatever about what I was doing. And when I got back in Detroit a few years after that, I guess it was another brother from here that went to the East Coast Black Age comics. We never crossed paths, but the fact that he still remained, he was into comics as well. Abiyomi Allen is his name. When I uh, met him through Yumi, because Yumi called me and asked me to hook up with this individual to see about doing the Black Age comics in Detroit. And I was telling him, you know, I don't think I'm going to have time to, to uh, do that because I have so many things on my plate. At the time, you know, really working on uh, dreadlocks and really trying to get it where I wanted it. So uh, I told him, you know, I'm going to go ahead and meet this brother because I think it's a good idea to have something like that in Detroit. Because why? Detroit is like 85% uh, black. At that time, I think it was 90% black up in here. So <laughs> I said, what better place to have it than here? Right. So I ended up meeting Nabiomi Allen. Uh, he was a member of the Shrine of the Black Madonna. So we had the first event at um, upstairs of the Shrine of Black Madonna. And we had like maybe 15, 20 people there tops. And it was a hell of an event. You know, we had entertainment going on because, you know, you guys have been to the Motor City Black Age. Entertainment is always part of the event. So they had that. We started off right there. And uh, it was really popping. It was me, uh, Abiyomi Allen, uh, Poetic Menace, and my, my brother, uh, Khaled. I mean, uh, Khalil, Khalil Maha, uh, sorry, Khalil Benel. He was uh, part of the movement at the time, and we just popped at that point, and we just kept Motor City Black Age going from there. Now, as far as the different setbacks that we possibly can run into is the fact of venues. Uh, venues is a big thing in Detroit. Uh, some venues are just over the top as far as what they want to charge. Some venues, you can get them, get right in there, and it's no problem. But the thing is, it's not big enough. Then you have those that are too small that you can get right in, but they're just not big enough for the people to hold the people that's coming as far as patrons and spectators. Uh, and then you have people that come in and uh, kind of like just just don't support like they should. That, that That's a big thing as well. But we've been gaining a whole lot of support since uh, – past past five years or so a lot of support okay yeah. so what made you decide to interject manga into it that, that's the real that's question, question. You, you know what made me in, uh, do that because i was thinking a while back you know a lot of uh young brothers and sisters out here they really into manga and anime and i was like you know it would be good to really get them to be a part of the motor city black age of comics but never could i figure out what to do or pinpoint it until I ended up meeting you, Urban. <laughs> I oh. met you. You the one who said, you know, how about you try this that? And ever since then, you know, I was like, good idea. And you know, I've been connected Thank with you. uh <laughs> Yumacon. Once I connected with Yumacon, it's more and more people now that are um 
open to being involved, you know, with the Motor City Black Age of Comics, and especially now that I added the manga onto it. Because I feel, you know, I'm a traditionalist as far as, you know, what I do with my comics. And a lot of us, you know, senior uh, senior artists and creators, we're all tra- traditionalists. I don't know if you guys know Tian and yeah, of course. Uh, Dudley, yeah, you know, you know them. We're traditionalists for the most part, and it's good to bring on, uh, bring up the young cats and get them into it, even if they are doing uh, manga and not traditional style comics, because it's the only thing it's doing is bridging the gap, and it brings more people out to support those that do manga and those that do traditional comics. Mm-hmm. The more the merrier. And I think that's right. what it's about is uh, us making a connection because that's what I was going to ask about the barriers. What were some of the challenges um, in re- being a traditional artist, um, comic book artist, and being integrated in marketing in today's time where it's so anime, manga, heavy influenced and like digital. So like, how do you bridge that gap? Well, that's a gap that uh, I don't think it'll ever, ever be really bridged and connected because as long as you have um, the the younger individuals coming into the game and they're they're strictly manga, 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 and the traditionalists are strictly traditionalists, traditionalist artists and creators, if they constantly think like that, we'll never be able to bridge the gap. Hmm. But the thing is, if you open it up for everybody or everyone, what happens is now, like I was saying a little bit earlier, not only do I get support for my traditional work, but you all get uh, support for uh, manga as well. So that's the way I look at it as far as bridging uh, the gap. Mm. Um, it's it's not really difficult because once once I connected with uh, Yumakon, like I said, you know, uh, I go down there and there's a lot of artists there of color that's doing it up. They're doing it big. You know, I like, you know, a lot of the work myself. You know, I'm not a, a manga person, but I love the, some of the work and they got some good work. And it's just about whether they want to connect with uh, comics, because for some odd reason, us that's doing this work, as far as um, traditional work and those that are doing manga, we tend to separate the two. Right. You know, there's no separation. You know, it's just like, um, you know, me being who I am being black in America and somebody else being black in, uh, in America, but they identifying with something else. They fail to realize we're still the same technically, yeah. <laughs> you know, even though you're doing manga, you're still the same. I'm mm-hmm. doing traditional comics. Guess what? We're still the same. Let's connect this, these two together. It's kind of hard to get a lot of manga artists to understand that, believe it or not. Cause a lot of, you know, they stuck on manga thinking, Oh no, Oh no. Traditional comics. I guess I don't know what the deal is. But they they need to figure it out though themselves. Hey, this gap that it, it needs to be bridged, and that it only helps all of us if we do that. Yeah, yeah, and I think some of that is generational, right? So right. I'm gonna use a connection with me and you, right? We're pretty much family, right? Right, right. Long majority of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was ushered in. Mm-hmm. As a com- under comics, even though I was exposed, my generation, me and Urban are the same age bracket. Uh, mm-hmm. we came in through Toonami, right? A lot of right. the anime came there, Pokemon mm-hmm. and Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon. Mm-hmm. So we watched that. So as a kid, you draw what you see, similar to how right. a lot of traditional artists would say, Oh, Stan Lee or Jack Kirby, or mm-hmm. you know, who who is the one Mark always tells us, Irvin? Oh John uh, Burns. Oh, yeah, John That's Burns. John Burns, John Burns right. Um, Hey, and that's all respect that to you, John Byrne. We, we respect your work. You know? <laughs> no, no. And that's what it is. We, as the younger crew, have to respect those who came before us. But mm-hmm. we got to also help the older crew incur- be encouraged by the differences. Because some of that right. is just what you're exposed to. And the reason why I said this is because I think that there is, we're in a unique space being OEL. We're like shining spotlight. Mm-hmm. And we can actually help bridge that gap with the younger generations and the older generations and just say, hey, we want more creatives to just create. Let's just right. do this journey I think, together. I think it's really quick to note, because I don't think we said this in the beginning, but, you know, Jay, you know, you're not, you know, like co-hosting this, but you're also an artist yourself. You know, you're oh, also yeah. Trying, you know, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think we mentioned that. You know, well, I mean, this, no, isn't, you know, this isn't my interview. This is all about Andre. I just want no, to no, of course. Problems. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> it's good to mention that. <laughs> it's yeah. good to mention it. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. but going back to seeing you create, watching you even create a page in front of me or coming over with family members and 
seeing you market and seeing you do things, me watching that process, I grew respect. And I think sometimes exposure from the older crowd can help the younger crowd kind of see that, hey, we are here together. I've been in your shoes in reality. So mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, um, how, um, what are your biggest inspirations um, or influences in regards to your actual work in and of itself? Well, I have, a, I have a lot of influences, believe it or not. Um, it depends on what angle, you know, you know, I'm looking at it as because I look at things so different sometimes. But we already know the, uh, you know, uh, Stanley's, uh, Jack Kirby's of the world. You know, that, that was a major influence because I grew up reading that. Uh, I, I grew up going to a uh, box theater, watching movies. The Shaw Brothers, you know, you guys got manga and all that. We had the Shaw Brothers back then, which was live action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I grew up watching a lot of that. I was entertained by a lot of the uh, master being killed, you know, and the student have to avenge him consistently <laughs> in all the stories. <laughs> yeah. But needless to say, I grew up on that. You look at uh, music was a great influence on me as well because you know, when I started getting into uh, doing my comics, you got to think that was during the time of conscious hip hop. Uh, and when that, you know, that just not sent me over the edge, but it sent me over the edge to what I felt that I needed to do with comics at the time. You know, uh, different textbooks that I was reading, uh, I still have to this day, some. And a lot of information that I was just reading was just, you know, just, just, boiling in my head it had to go somewhere I just couldn't hold that information within so the thing that I was always taught or I've always learned was you know when you have information you just can't hoard the information you got to find a way to you know share that information so I know the average person you know is not going to read textbooks to understand anything you know we get enough of that through K through 12 so once we pass that we really don't want to be bothered anymore but needless to say I found another way to express a story or express culture through um, the comic books. No one was really doing that back in in the uh, 90s. Even those that I had uh, spoke of that that I was, you know, greatly appreciative to meeting, they weren't doing conscious comics or whatever. Mm. You did have a few individuals that were out there back then, but I didn't really know much about them or of them. I never met them before. Uh, but some of the stories was similar, but not mine was more superhero based as far as what I do. Uh, I think the brother he did a comic book called Hey Rule, which was cool. I he only did one in, one installation of it, and uh, and mine is kind of similar to that, but mine was superhero based, and you know, that was a big influence. But the influence come from what I wasn't seeing, though. To be honest, that's mm -hmm. where it came from. You know, even though I did meet a lot of brothers, a few brothers that was doing black comics, um, I didn't see what I was looking for in the comics. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to try another angle, and that's what the route that I went. And um, people tell you, Dreadlocks was truly very hardcore in the early days. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once again, I tell you, edutainment, hip hop, Karis one, Chuck D. Just think of the the the, the one. Uh, CD they or tape back then that they made Fear of the Black Planet. That's what Dread Locks was all about when it first started. Uh, and I, you know, I ended up calming him down quite a bit through time, but still the message is still the same. And that's important to mention. Um, and that's what made me so interested in this interview is because using our voice is so important. And I think that's something that we could learn from original creators, like me myself being on the younger end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. is how much you guys actually pull from other sources as fans, of course, but also to tell a story that you want to see, like it's actually you expressing yourself. So I would actually ask you, what advice would you give younger creators, manga, comics, music, whatever? What would be some some tips that you would give us? Well, number one, I always like to tell everybody to stay true to their craft. That's I always tell anybody to stay true to their craft. Craft, and also, uh, as you point out, I pointed out a little bit earlier. You know, grab those straws from everything that you're involved with. Mm -hmm. Each straw is going to teach you something. You just got to break it and learn from it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's music, because music has different messages in it, you pick up and learn off the music. 
uh, okay, I can kind of add something to this, and I have a serious story with this right here. Uh, look at the artwork that's out there. Learn from the different artists that are out there. Learn from the different story, story writers out there. And, you know, basically develop your own craft. And once you develop your own craft, you will stay true to it because that's your love. Your craft is yours. There's no one else's. Once you do it, you put it out there, people will start gravitating to it. The thing is, you just have to stay focused and not be discouraged. Uh, you know, it's a lot of things out here that can discourage us and doing comics, manga, um, even prints or whatever. Uh, you know, we get that a lot out here, but that's that should never stop us <laughs> at all. But a lot of us get, once we get discouraged, we just sit back in and uh, say, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -mm. Doesn't well, work like days. that. I have it once yeah. a week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh-oh. We lost I, Andre just for a moment. Um, I'm not sure what happened, but I'm going to assume he's going to be back on in just a moment. But what we'll do is we'll use this time Mm -hmm. to go ahead and just briefly mention the Honeycomb Hideout. You know, so we're at the halfway point. Honeycomb Hideout is our um, our show where, you know, we have like, you know, through Imaginos, where if you think of Howard Stern for geeks, if you like geek culture, geek talk, you know, about serious issues, social issues, this is the show for you. You'll want to check it out. You can find it on Spotify. I believe it's on Apple Podcasts. I'm going to put a link down below so you guys can check it out. But it is definitely something that you guys are going to want to see. Now, we're going to go ahead and bring Andre back. Andre looks like he's back. Let's pull him back in. Okay. Alrighty. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I'm not sure what happened. I'll, I'll yeah. that for you. That's a professional right there. I'm, I'm oh, yeah. yeah. On Irving. yeah good move. <laughs> good, good move on that. Good move. Yeah, <laughs> great move. But actually, now that you're back, you know, there's. I want to get into the second half, you know, of what we were going to talk about. I want to get a little bit more ditty gritty into your journey um i know not only have you actually done um you know or you obviously you have your own convention but you are obviously an avid convention goer yourself in terms right. of being able to market your brand for urban style comics so mm -hmm. what i want to know you know because this is even for me this is for everyone else out here you know who is on the convention scene no matter what group you're with or whatever and this can help you i want people to listen because even if you're in the manga space, this is going to help you. Believe it. It's going to help you. And I know I'm wearing the Naruto shirt and I said, believe it. So please don't <laughs> think of that. But um, in any case, how many conventions do you go to a year, would you say, on average? I know it may, be, it may yeah. vary depending on the year, but like if you'd say maybe in the past 10 years, like every year, like how many would you say? I try to make it to at least five conventions. I want to do more or whatever. Uh, but I have to get into particular conventions that I want to get back into. Like, um, I want to get back into the San Diego Comic Con. Uh, I think I'm ready to get back there now. Uh, New York Comic Con, I would like to get back there again. Uh, you know, of course, Motor City Comic Con, because that's local. Uh, we got the Black Comic Books Arts Festival that takes place in New York. That's pretty huge. Mm. We have, uh, of course, Motor City Black Age. We have uh, Kim Fest, which is in, in Jersey. Uh, I would like to get into BlurCon, but I think BlurCon is more for uh, cosplayers. I'm not for sure, but from what I was told, that's the case. But I would like to go for myself just to see. I may just go visit it and uh, check it out and see what it's all about before I make that decision. Uh, so it's usually about five a year. But I'm trying to, at this point, now I can start getting into doing more, uh, more, more cons. But this, it has to be more of this, uh, this geared towards black comic book creators. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Uh, because I feel that when you do certain cons that are mainstream cons, it's a lot of money to do those cons. And if you're catching a plane to these cons, you know, there's no way you can take all of your uh, merchandise there to sell. You can take it, but you have to ship it. And if you're shipping it, uh, that's, you know, co the cost of it is just crazy. But uh, if you can drive to it, that's no issue at all because you can take a lot. Uh, but the thing of the matter, how much you're spending for that con, how much you're spending as far as your 
you know, uh, stay there, your travels, we have, you have in your, your, you know, uh, when you're eating, you know, your food, all that good stuff, lodging, all that has to be thought up, thought out. So that's what determines how many cons you do and what do you think is going to uh, help you out in the long run. And I do uh, other events as well. Like if someone's doing something and they invite me, like I have a uh, in Detroit, um, it's a Dow show that's coming up in November. Mm. Sandy's Land's called it's a Dow show. She's doing in November at uh, Mary Grove College. Uh, we'll be participating in that because, of course, I have the Dreadlocks action figures. So I got to have those there with, you know, of course, my books as well. So I'm looking forward to that. And that's local. So you, you have a lot of local events that's starting to uh, kick off as well. And we have to think of it in the sense of you don't necessarily have to hit a comic con in order to get the recognition and get yourself out there, mm. believe it or not. And I've learned that through the years from when I used to go to um, African World Festival or the Caribbean festivals out in Chicago. And I learned that from uh, Brother Dawood when he was telling me about the Black Expos back then. Because I would go to um, Chicago Black Expo, St. Louis Black Expo, and Indianapolis Black, Black Expo. And, man, they they loved what we were doing back then. And still to this day, I'm sure if I popped up in one of those, it would be the same love. But now it's more material now. Uh, so I look at doing five a year, you know, where I'm not burnt out or whatever you know because really i'm so low on it now because my partner he's in philadelphia he's trying to get back into doing the comics again which i'm sure he will be getting back in brother khalil uh khalil Panea. he'll be getting back in real soon he's uh almost done with his story um uh, i got my nephew caleb which say uh, you know who caleb is yeah you know we get ready to start on his book real soon oh and uh because I'm trying to get his ready for this um, Urban Nerd Con that I'm going to in July down in Atlanta. And uh, I'm trying to have his stuff ready for when I go down there. So, you know, I'm trying to get him in, get Jerron, he getting into it too, so get him focused as well. So, yeah, we're going to be hitting more cons. <laughs> so it's a matter of time. This so sounds it's, like an independent, uh, like selling mixtapes off the trunk. Got a lot of hip hop you. influence and in how you yeah, drive yeah. I like it. Yes, yeah, so I've done that all uh, ever since I've started Urban Style Comics because that's the only way. Because yeah. you got to think about it now, you really don't have um, the bookstores. We didn't right. really have bookstores back then, but we had more than you do now. But I've always been one of them types that I'm selling out the trunk of my car. Mm. <laughs> So is there a determining factor when you go to shows, whether or not you decide, hey, you know what, I don't want to do this show anymore. This show is kind of this way or, oh, you know what, I'm going to do this show. In fact, I'm going to pour, you know, um, three hundred dollars into mm -hmm. printing, you know, more inventory, you know, for books or, you know, like what is your determining factor, whether or not you continue to do a show? And then also we kind of asked Todd Johnson this, too, this before, too, like. How much do you take to a show in terms of like inventory? Question. Well, it, it's several things. I'll, I'm not going to name this show in particular or whatever, but I did a show uh, last year. I was I think last year. Took my wife there, my dog. <laughs> got a nice little hotel room. I've done the show before and I'm, I made pretty good, but the, the show was only like um, a two day show back then. No, it was a one day show back then. So. They ended up making it a three-day show, and when I did it, I walked out with nothing. I think I sold maybe five books tops. I was really pissed off about it. The individual asked me at the Motor City Comic Con when he seen me, was I going to come back to the show again? And I told him, well, uh, I'm thinking about it, which oh, actually I will be on vacation at the time, but I don't think I will do that show again. Even though I did done, I had done well prior to that particular year, but if I have a bad year like that, mm. a bad show, the chances of me doing that show again is very slim. Mm. Even if I did have a good show the year before. Yeah. Uh, reason being because I see the direction that the your your show is going in. And it's not a, a direction that's going to be beneficial for me financially. Mm. Right. As far as my books are concerned, I'm not one of these people that print out 50 books and go to a show and say, hey, I sold out. You know, I'm not doing that because I've seen an individual do that a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago. 
they went to a show and then they posted all over social media that they sold out. <laughs> you know, so one thing about me, I'm not going to be all over social media telling people what I sold and all that kind of good stuff because really it's none of their business. You know, and the thing is, if I'm doing good, I'm doing good. And people will know that. I just like to post pictures of how much fun I was having at the show. That fun calculates into the dollars that I made. If you see all the pictures, you know, okay, all right, yeah, he's making pretty good. So I'm not going to sit up and say I made, you know, $1,000, $2,000, $220, none of that. I'm not going to do that. But needless to say, the determining factor is when I do a show and it's a bust, I may not ever do it again. Uh, as far as how many books I take, I also do merchandise as well. And I say that because why merchandise sells. You need to figure if the young ladies come to the table and say they're not into uh, comics or whatever, they got their kids that want a book, they'll buy a book or, or a post or a print. Uh, but they'll turn, then they'll turn around and see the T-shirts. Be like, whoa, I, I think I want to get a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. So merchandise is everything. So people have to learn to build their merchandise up as well when they're out here doing the shows. Uh, but as far as how many books I have to take, uh, I, I have to take more than enough, to be honest. Not to, I don't take all my books to sell them out. I just take more than enough just in case I sell. I'm getting to the point of selling out. And selling out to me is like a good 500 books. You know, I like to take over that amount. So when you take that, I like to at least sell over half, a little bit over half of that, then I'm doing real good. Because if you look at like, say, the Motor City Comic Con, I'll throw that out there. The show is uh, not really an expensive show, but it's a good show because you can take 700 to 1,000 books, sell half of them, and you've already made your lodging, your uh, food, and your table. The whole thing is making all of that and then making more. Once you make more, then you're making money. That's my determining factor of why I would do Motor City Comic Con again. Now, I, won't, I probably won't do it twice a year because they do have the event in October. Uh, the October show was pretty slow. But it was still good, lucrative, but it wasn't what it is in May. Uh, and the reason why I won't do it in October, do it twice a year, is because why? sometimes I may see the same people over and over. And I really, I'm one of these people, I really don't like seeing the people, same people over and over again, unless it's the fans or whatever. I like to see them over again. But sometimes you see people that's just walking by the booth all the time, which are the same people that's been walking by the past five years. Right. It's like, what's their purpose of even being here? Yeah. Or you get those that come up to your booth and say, what's this? Dude, you had a comic con. What do you think it is? Are you serious? <laughs> so needless to say, right. <laughs> so needless to say, I like to take enough to try to sell out. The whole, That's the whole thing. If I have leftover books, then it is what it is. Because when I go to New York, to the Black Comic Book Arts Festival, you will sell out. You have to take a thousand plus books there. Mm. Because if they're coming to every single table to buy something, mm. you know, they are not playing around out there. There's a difference out there. And, and when they, they hit, when the doors opened this last time, it, it, I wasn't even expecting what happened. I was like, it was too much going on. But at the same time, I made it happen. I didn't, yeah. uh, you know, I didn't uh, get nervous and say, oh, I can't do this. No. They came in. One one little kid, he handed his mom two T-shirts, <laughs> bought both T-shirts. That's fifty dollars right there. Yeah, you know. So I say that as far as the price is concerned, it's because now we're looking at me making the money now, eight dollars. Mm. Now we're looking at twenty-five dollars selling it. What what's that profit margin there? Seventeen dollars. Mm-hmm. So looking at that, that's when you're looking at making money. Yeah, and that's you why you have to have your merchandise. Exactly, you sell four T-shirts for twenty-five. That's a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars, right there. Now you, exactly, you haven't even sold a book yet. Mm -hmm. Now you're selling your book at what five to ten dollars. Right. Now you got your graphic novel. You sell it for twenty dollars. Exactly. And they're selling left and right. So you so, wear a lot of hats too, Andre. Mm -hmm. How many hats do you wear? Like, what are all your jobs, especially being on the independent <laughs> grind? Like, you have a lot of jobs. Like, could you give us a little bit of information on, like, how you're able to manage all of this by yourself? Or do you reach out to support for support? Like, how do you do that? 
Well, I do uh, manage a lot uh, myself, whatever, but I've also uh, hired a lot of different freelance artists that work with me because I still continue to write my story or whatever. So because until I can get someone or meet someone that can write damn near an exact story that I write, then I'll get another writer in. Uh, but I write most of my stories. I get different artists to work on different things. Uh, obviously, I publish it myself. Uh, when I first started back in, you know, the early 90s and whatnot, I was reading different books as far as self-publishing that I would get from, from um, not Barnes & Noble, but back then we had Borders Bookstore. Yes. Yeah. Went there, get my books on self-publishing and learning, you know, learning screenwriting. Uh, I was learning a whole lot, you know, as far as that's concerned. Um, so that taught me a lot as far as the self-publishing books. Mm. So I published my books myself. I go out here and promote it myself. I've always been good on marketing and promotions because I was doing that even prior to the Internet days. Yeah. Uh, because we'll go back to what we were saying earlier about selling out the trunk. I would mm-hmm. pop up somewhere, you know, somebody have a, a show or an event going on. Guess what? Guess who's in there? Me selling my comics. <laughs> People are like, wait a minute, comics don't have nothing to do with what we're doing here. But guess what? People are buying them. <laughs> this right. is what I do. Yeah. So that that helped get my uh, fan base up quite a bit to the point where, you know, kids that were six years old when their fathers and mothers was buying my books, they're now 30 years old saying, hey, I still got the first one mm-hmm. that was in black and white. <laughs> you know, so that's a good thing to me. That's that's a beautiful thing to me. So all the hats that I wear, it's a lot of them. <laughs> Trust me, it's, just, it's almost as many baseball hats I actually have, but uh, <laughs> it's a lot. I got a lot of baseball hats. So how long would you say to, because I I hear varying things for people when it comes to like, you know, for example, like how long it takes to do a comic page, you know, but we're talking mm. to like different people, but how long does it take on average for you guys to complete an issue of, let's say, dreadlocks? Like, you know, is it, does it take a couple months? You know, does it take, you know, a few weeks? Like, how does that go? <laughs> Actually, it really doesn't take long at all. It depends on, you know, the approval the approval rate uh, and um, or if the artists decide they just want to just draw what they want to draw and you're just going to like it and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. Yeah. So if I'm trying to, I'm one of these type of individuals. I feel that by me being an artist myself, I have to be able to tell a story without any words, if that makes sense, it does. just with images only. So if I can tell a story with words, then we're getting somewhere. So if an artist try to hand me two pages and I don't see what's being conveyed here, guess what? He's got to draw them over again. Mm-hmm. So that may take a little time right there because I'm very, very um, strict on that. Very, I'm stuck on that. Been like that for years. Even when I was drawing them myself, you know, I didn't like this page. I don't like this page. But what it is, it may takes me, take me uh, approximately – it could take me a month to two months tops to complete a whole book. Oh, that's not if, bad. If, yeah, if I let the artist just stay on it and he's conveying the message, and like I got the artist, one artist that I'm working with, his name is Rom. He already know exactly what to do. He gets on it, he get it done in a month if I let him. Oh, wow. <laughs> in a okay. month, he can get it done just that quick. Irvin and then smile. of course, get ammo. Right. It's 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 right. No, just no. that quick. You know, I get to uh, I get to do my colors, but see, that's where the the slowdown comes is when I start doing the colors and highlights and all that good stuff in the, in the dialogue. Room, right, that's when it slows up because I'm doing so much, you know, outside of comics. You know, I work for a living as well, and uh, that takes up a lot of time. And when I come home and I, I like to get my colors in, and the thing is, I, I fall asleep right at the computer. And uh, boom, I wake up later on like, whoa, what the hell am I doing in here? Sleep. I should be in the bed. Then I cut my computer off, leave it, save everything, leave it right where it is, and then get back on it, you know, the next day or two days later. So, so it sounds like, I mean, outside of you just wearing hats, you have a pretty good understanding of your vision. And how does right. that work? Like being like, because I know you, you're, you sound like you color too. So you right. write, you draw, and you color. So you pretty much can do all the jobs that right. you need done. So it kind of helps you with the editing process with dealing with younger artists mm-hmm. or artists in general. So what is like the biggest challenge working with people 
uh, in regards to creating your vision? Well, the biggest challenge, and I'm sure this is probably most uh, creators and publishers or editors' uh, biggest challenge is when individuals come along, they want to uh, change everything and make it what they want it to be. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. You have a lot of artists that come along. And, you know, I, I think it, 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 we should do it like this. N- this is not your project to think that this is what we're going to do. It's my project, so you're going to do exactly what I want to be done. Mm-hmm. You know, so that can be a challenge as well. So you get a lot of artists that don't want to work with you because um, you 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 telling them, you letting them know that hey, only thing your name is going on is artists. That's it. You're not the creator. So we run into issues there. Uh, whereas some artists, they don't care. They're going to do exactly what you say as long as they're getting paid for it. They're freelance artists. That's why they're freelance artists to do what you ask them to do, nothing more. Mm-hmm. Now, they bring something that you never thought of, <laughs> and you see that, wow, this is really dynamic and this is beautiful. Let's work with it. If you see that, okay, that's not a challenge. You you just upgraded me to a whole nother level. Mm-hmm. Whereas for the most part, that is a challenge with a lot of uh, artists dealing with different artists. They want to do what they want to do. And, uh, some want to charge you prices that, you know, these big, big willies are getting and uh, yeah. they're not even there yet. You know, nowhere near Jim there. Prices. You know? Right. Yeah. Jim Lee or more. And it's like, <laughs> you're not even there. I, w- I would never get a book out if I'm paying you $500, $600 a page. Are you serious? Right. <laughs> <laughs> do you think maybe people sometimes do that when they, it's like the kind of the get out of my face price? Like, I really don't want to do it. So I'm just going to highball it so that you'll, you'll leave no, I don't, me alone. I don't, I don't think they do that or whatever, um, because everybody loves money. Number one, that's number one. So they'll do anything as far as drawing it price wise. Price wise, I think uh, the rules, the standards have been set up, and I don't know who set the standard rules up as far as how much individuals should get paid for a page. But whoever set it up, that's what they follow, yeah. whether that's the case or not. Yeah. You know, I don't think we have any unions in this right here at all. <laughs> Usually something like that is set up by a union. That we don't have that. So how do you and that and that's a good question. That's something I'm glad you brought that up because I know me as a creator, when you're new, that's another thing that can be a barrier is when you're coming in, you don't know like the business because it's it's a creative business. It's like I know we have a set standard now. I'm starting to learn that myself, but how did you navigate like how you sold product or how much it cost or how did you follow like the market value? Like what was your process in figuring that out? So the process that I follow basically is first off, I see how much it costs me to print my books. That's the number one thing. The second, I'll, I'll venture off into the uh, comic book stores to see how much they're selling their books for, you know, like four ninety five or whatever. Back then it was like, two dollars and some change or 125 and i have to look at what i'm actually putting into this book as far as to get it printed Mm. and i have to look at also what the uh mainstream is doing how much they're actually putting in their books which is hard little or nothing where they're getting their books printed which is little or nothing Uh, i have to look at what they're doing and then i have to look at what i'm doing so when i look at what i'm doing i have to factor my price based on that alone because mm. once i see that i know i can't meet those prices because mm. uh my book uh, i think the average comic now is like 4.95 or something in in, yeah. in the comic book stores That's about right i couldn't sell my comic book at 4.95 or whatever uh you know unless i was just grabbing and going to you know to a show and that was it but i couldn't put it into a comic book store and sell it for that price because of course the comic book store is going going to want to knock off half of the money, you know, for a wholesale or even consignment. Mm-hmm. So once they knock that off, that puts you at two dollars and forty five cents somewhere around there. But you spent a dollar and eighty eight cents to get it printed. So you lose the money all the way around mm-hmm. doing that. You know, uh, some people will ask the question, you know, your books in the comic book stores, blah blah. blah. And I'm gonna be honest. The only reason why you put your book in the comic book store is just so people can see it, mm-hmm. not to sell it, because you're not going to make any money there. Mm-hmm. 
at all. So where do you make most of your money? Is it oh man? I, I, I make most of my off the uh the internet, my uh, my sales off my website, my website store. Um and mostly it sh- it shows uh particular shows I make more at more show certain shows like um uh, like I said black com- black comic book festival. Mm-hmm. Um, I do pretty good at mine, Motor City Black Age and uh Motor City Comic Con I did real good there. Uh so mostly at the shows and what you make off the sales on the internet. Hmm. Okay, okay, okay. So we're coming down on the last kind of like few minutes here on, on the show. Um, I feel like I was getting ready to cut you off, Che. I just wanted to make sure I say that. But if you've been watching the show, you've been liking all these nuggets Andre's been giving us today. Give us a like and make sure you subscribe as well. Just got to throw that out there. But absolutely. Anyway, we're going to say, Che. No, I I know we running all the time. I could do this all day, right? This is (laughs) just like talking to family. So it's just like, Like yeah, Yeah, we do it all day. Correct. (laughs) I want to ask who would be like dream collaborators, people you would want to work with, whether it's people we know, industry, local, it doesn't matter. Like, who are some people you would love to just collaborate on ideas with? Uh, I would love to collaborate with um uh, Dawood because you know he's got he's got the same vision that I follow for the most part. Um, I would love to collaborate and do a full book with a brother named Shindo. I would love to do something with him. Uh, let's see, shit, I would love to work with Jim Lee. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's one of my favorites out there. Uh, Dale Keon, I would love to work with him. Uh, it's a lot of. I'm gonna be honest. It's a lot of individuals that I would love to collaborate with and uh, do some work. Um, uh, because it's a lot of outstanding work out there. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of it that's out there. I would love to collaborate with everybody in Detroit. Do like a whole universe dealing yeah. with uh, <laughs> you know, a, a certain entity that we have to combat and deal with. Uh, but we gotta I'm come sure. together right here. <laughs> <laughs> Message. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I think I get it. I, I pick up on that. Oh, you do? Okay. All right. <laughs> so like I say, you know, I, I would love to work with anybody as long as they their vision is there. Uh you gotta have that vision and you gotta wanna do it. You can't be discouraged. You can't let nothing discourage you. It boils down to that. You gotta be focused. And and if you focus, yeah, I can work with you. If not, then uh, you you're stepping in the wrong uh, ballpark over here. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I want to, I'm gonna ask you our traditional question. You know, everybody who's been watching Shining Spotlight for a while, they know this question. Um, if you're new to Shining Spotlight, which is obviously could be the case, because this is episode one of season five. Which again, subscribe if this is your first time watching us. Um, what is your end game? Meaning. What do you, you know, when you look at the span of your entire career, you know, thus far in comics, when you become an old man, when you're just sitting back and you're looking at everything you've done, what do you want your career to look like, you know, just thus far? Or, you know, it doesn't necessarily even have to be comics. It can be greater than that or different than that. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of that Thanos question. You know, what is your end game? Well, to be honest, uh, I don't have an end game because I'm, I'm still doing it. Uh, you know, my, my my game is a forever game, if that makes sense, because I'm already an old man, so I'm getting <laughs> older. <laughs> so to say, I'm in the forever game. So mm-hmm. can't, I'm going to be like, uh, I should say this, I'm like LeBron James in comics, <laughs> in black comics. I'm going to be here forever. But my end game, though, for real, though, is um, I want to have something, live live action movie, something like that. You know, if I'm sitting in my little lazy boy, I can open up the television streaming channel. Oh, they go drag locks right there. That's powerful. I, I would love to see like a lot of little kids, you know, like dreadlocks is their favorite character, mm-hmm. their favorite superhero, stuff like that. That that's what I'm looking for right there. It's nothing really uh I guess that would be major, but it's yeah. you know, something that I would be looking at. Animated movies, animated series. And I'll still be around. That's why I say I'm in the fabric game. Yeah. Yeah. Legacy. Mm-hmm. Household name. That. Correct. That's it. I hear and that. then I would like to see my nephews, you know, get do their thing. You know what I'm talking about, Shay? Yeah. Get out there and do their thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Succession. So that, and, it, and then it'll continue on. 
that's it. That gap. That's it. Mm, okay. Okay. So where can people out there follow you? Where can they check out your stuff? You know, if, if I'm like, you know what, I really want to pick up a Dreadlocks comic right this moment. I want this in the mail by the end of the week. Okay, they could go to uh, urbanstylecomics.com or urbanstylecomics.store, or they can just pull me up on social media, just pull up my name, Andre Batts, and I can okay. direct them. Okay, and we're going to include links to that down below. Um, obviously, I want to also make sure I take this time to say, make sure you check out the Motor City Black Age of Comics. You know, um, you know, this video is going up on, um, it should either be a Monday or a Tuesday when this video goes up. So hopefully a lot of you guys see it then. If you were watching this after the video, this convention happens every year. So you can come to it next year if you missed it for whatever reason, if you're watching this months from now when we put it out. Uh, but definitely recommend coming to this con. Um, you know, definitely support. You don't have to just be black to come to the con. You can be, you know, any ethnicity. You know, it's all welcome to all different types of people, um, you know, to just be able to take part in. Um you know, and there's a location there of the con as well. So if you're local and it's only $5, I believe it's still $5, right? You know? Yes. Uh, you and I want to say something, uh, Irma. Thank you for saying that it's uh, open to everyone because I had somebody the other day that's all confused or whatever. I'm glad you said that. Oh, wait. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. <laughs> you know, I, I want people to know that. It's like, hey, it's, it's one of those things where pro us, pro black doesn't mean anti anything else. It's just, right, this correct. is our voice and we want to try to participate, but. This is what the basis is around. So now I hear you right. and I understand. Correct. So with that being said, does, do you have anything else that you would like to say, Andre, to you know anyone or any nuggets out there you want to say? Uh, I would like to tell everybody once again, everyone is into doing manga or comics to make sure you stay true to, your, to the game and stay focused on your craft and just keep developing your craft because you can only get better. You can't get any worse unless you just leave it alone and drop it. Stay true to the game. Okay, okay. Do you have anything else to say, Che? No, I'm all set. You know, I'm just excited. I'm honored. Um, I'm appreciative for being able to speak with you for my first interview. So interviewing family for the first interview was <laughs> a great feeling. Um, I'm just sure. excited to have, you know, known you for so long, see how much progress and how many people and young men around, you know, when you said, yeah, I know somebody 30 years old and they were six when they got this comic, I'm one of them. Right. <laughs> this still mm -hmm. has the original so full <laughs> circle. Full circle. Right, full that circle. Full circle moment. So I just want mm -hmm. to say thank you so much for that. That's no problem. Appreciate you being around still, doing the right thing. Absolutely. Well, I hope that all of you guys out there have enjoyed this interview. We, you know, obviously have a lot of other interviews that are going to be coming in the next coming weeks. We'll be putting these episodes typically out on Sundays. This is a little bit different because we did want to put this out before the Motor City Black Age of Comics uh, because the comic is coming up this week. Uh, but um, again, you know, make sure you subscribe to the channel, you know, like the video, you know, just it helps out the channel a lot, guys. Um, check out some of the other projects that we have coming on later on this year. You know, we are going to be releasing an anthology project. Che is actually going to be a part of that as well called the Origami Super Punch. So you'll want to see that. I'm going to be putting out a comic called Killbox. You want to check in that out as well. And there's a lot of others, but we'll, we'll put little videos on the channel about that. But that's why you should subscribe. And make sure you check out all of Andre's links as well down below. So you want to make sure you pick you know pick up a copy of Dreadlocks. You know, come to the Motor City Black Age, say hello. Even if you just want to say hello, just stop on by. Uh, but thank you guys for watching. And we will see you guys later. Right, right. Peace.